your highnesses, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, I am not going to be talking about business nor uh, about my specific road to success or failure for that matter in, in running a business, but I'm going to talk about uh, my own experience in demarginalizing myself from the development process in my own country, uh, addressing the challenges that my own society faces, and taking you through a story of, uh, of an extreme passion for myself about how do, you, how do we, the entrepreneurship uh, community, how do we entrepreneurs take ourselves uh, uh, out uh, from forgetting that we are part of the society and actually participating in change and development. So, uh, and I'm titling it that it takes a community, it takes uh, a mujtama to address uh, our issues. And I will start by talking about a small part in East Amman. I'm, I grew up in Amman. Uh, in East Amman, it's known that these are the communities that are on the margins. So uh, the marginalized, the forgotten, the people that have been outside of this process. And I'll start by my own discussion. I went to that community in 2005 with the challenge that says, how do I as a successful, if you want to call it that, entrepreneur, uh, get myself active in youth development. Because the biggest challenge in the Arab world was youth. And at that time, the World Bank came up with a report that says, by the year 2020, the Arab world requires to develop 100 million jobs. The biggest challenge in the Arab world was how do we actually create these jobs and get people out of the unemployment scene, get the youth the 28, the 28%, 30% youth unemployment. And I said, if this is only the challenge that government is addressing, then there's something wrong. Because this is a societal process, and if I am an entrepreneur, if I am an employer, then I need to be part of the process. And how do I actually take myself into it? So, from failure of addressing the issue, if you want to talk about failure, to taking it, to taking it to a place where an entrepreneur does. So what does an entrepreneur do? He starts a business. Instead of me starting a business, actually, I started a, what I am calling now an impact organization. A business that is actually not for profit, but it has a massive amount of impact on society that creates well-being in the society that is as important as any business can come out. And it is as important as any government's contribution. So if we put them all together, then we see this story. So I met Abu Kamil. I went to the community and they said, who the heck are you? Who are you? You are a stranger. You're coming from, East, from West Amman, the affluent part, and you're coming to East Amman, and we don't know who you are. Only government comes here, and government most of the time forgets us. So you need to tell us your real intentions. So this gentleman stood up. He's, I met with the elders of the community, and he said, you know, Fadi, I need to tell you something, that in 1967, most of you were not born in 1967, I was, I was a young boy. He said, in 1967, and he showed me a letter from the government in 1967 that said, we are going to establish a police station in Jabal al nadif but the police station was not there since 1967. He says, you need to address that issue today, otherwise we will not take you seriously. And then others in the community told me this. يعني هون لا في ملاعب ولا في منتزهات يعني الأطفال دائما في الشارع هون زي ما أنت شايف تطلع على الأطفال يعني ما فيش ولا أي شيء يعني يلعبوا فيه. كل يوم الصبح بطلع على الجامع طارق بصلي بألقاهم كلهم سكرانين الصبح ونمشى شو أقول لك يعني هاي جبل النظيف جبيل ومغفرين هان بدنا مركز صحي 24 ساعة ومغفر اللي يحافظ على الأمن بس لأنه شيكاغو صارت هون محتاجين لمكتب إن شاء الله نتعلم فيها وش يعني ونعلم الأطفال كمان منها This is the community that has fallen through the cracks. For nobody, it was not intentionally forgotten. But in development, nothing intentionally happens. It happened. That community of about 60,000 people had that challenge. And people were telling us, 
we need that back. So how do we actually get ourselves to do that? I went to the community to talk about how do I engage your youth, and they threw back at me. They said, if you want to come and visit us and be with us and participate with us, then you have to address uh, uh, all these issues that we are here. So a daunting challenge. And I came out like all entrepreneurs, very, very adventurously, I said, done. I am going to do it. But a young man also stood up and said, and this is a caricature from a famous Jordanian, just to show you the difference, just to show you the difference. He said, a 17-year-old man jumps up and says, you know, Fadi, I don't want you to bring the Western habits into the East. And what did I think when he said Western habits? I thought Western habits of the West, Europe, US. He said, no, 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 it's not Europe, US. I don't want you to bring West Amman habits into East Amman because we are two distinct communities. And this, this caricature tells us what it is in a very funny way, just to accentuate what the real story is. But then what does an entrepreneur does? And it, uh, it does start with an entrepreneur. And what do we do is that we have capital, we have a mentality of can-do, we take risks, we think solutions, and we have networks, and we're connected to governments, and we are employers. So we have every single element, in my view, every single element to address this, the challenges that this community has. If we don't have it directly, then we must be connected to someone that actually can address it. And what did they need, by the way? The community, in every single communication with us when we first visited them, they said, we want people to listen. Nobody sees us. We are completely forgotten. We need an ear so that people can listen, so that they can eventually come and address our problem. And how did I want to do that? To gain their trust. They said, you need to fix the school. This is a 50-year-old school, and it uh, serves, believe it or not, this is the school. This is the school. It serves 700 kids. 700 kids, two shifts, a shift that starts in the 7 in the morning and the shifts that starts at uh, 12 or 1 in the afternoon. And, and uh, in the afternoon, it's for girls, in the morning, it's for boys, etc., etc. But imagine the school. It was run down. This is how the school looked like. So my first challenge was to tell them, I'm going to fix the school. This is a public school, by the way. It's not a private school. This is a government institution. Nothing wrong with that. I went to government, I took their permission, I told them I have private sector, people, I have entrepreneurs, I have people that want to participate in this process. And automatically government said, okay, if you are stepping forward, we want to partner with you. Here are the standards, build it. So here's what happened. And then everything else that they asked for actually happened. And this is one photo that tells, it, tells the whole story. We built a community center, Ruwad. We built a Maktab al Shams al-Jabal, a small uh, library. We built a post office. They didn't have a post office. And by the way, post offices in Jordan are not for uh, posting letters. It is for getting government aid because people on the margins get their money through the post office, and these people had to walk 45 minutes to get to the post office, and we created a post office for them that employs people from the community. We built a, a, a health clinic, Marcus Sahi, and then eventually we went to the police with the community, and finally, we built a police station. So within a year and a half, every single thing that they asked for was brought to them, not, on, not by us, but by addressing their issue and making people realize that there is a partnership that needs to be done and we need to step forward. So government, private sector, and civil society, and everyone came and congregated to address that issue. We gained their trust. Suddenly, from a very, very uh, question uh, based system. Who are you? Why are you here? Are, and there is a Palestinian camp right next to the community. And they said, are you going to uh, basically get us to forget about Palestine? Is this an American conspiracy? And you can name it. And then the ideologues in the community, the people that, that uh, go to these marginalized com communities and take advantage of them in many ways. And I'm not going to address politics here, obviously, but you know what I'm talking about. These were the only people that are actually there. And then suddenly they have a private sector, an entrepreneurial community that comes and says, well, it's not only for you to develop. We want to be part of the process and we want to bring the whole community with us to address their issues. So we basically built a platform. And at the core of that platform, 
anybody can play in it. Anybody can come and plug into Silsal, into uh, Ruwad, in Jabal al nadif and bring your talents. Whatever you want to do, this is an open system. It revolves around, around the, 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 the stuff in the middle, a tamkeen al-shabab, the empowerment of youth. We give scholarships for kids uh, of, uh, uh, of college age, 18 to 22, and in return, they give us four hours of volunteer work, four hours of volunteer work to address the issues of their own community. So it is an alternative way of educating and building characters in society so that we're not only learning in schools, but we're, early, we're learning in real life by addressing our own challenges, our own challenges as youth who will own their streets. Meaning, if the street is dirty, clean it. You don't need to wait for government. If your neighbor is suffering, go do something about it because he is your neighbor. He's not my neighbor. So if you take these people and put them in a different way of feeling empowered that I can actually do something about it, then that platform does it. And I'll show you, you know, we have people from private sector companies coming in and, and bringing in their own employees to volunteer here. Schools, we have 36, 26 schools around us that bring us students to come and volunteer here. Government comes and addresses all sorts of challenges. Ministers, government ministers come and talk to these kids every single Saturday to address their challenges, talking about any issue you can imagine. And we have a legal aid office. Let me go very quickly with you. Uh, this is... Uh, sorry, um, uh, can we go back? Sorry, yes, thank you. So, Beit Salsal, I'm going to tell you, this is a, a Jordanian woman who is passionate about art and thinks that uh, people with physical handicaps, you can address their issues, physically challenged, they can address their issues through art. Look, look, and then Beit Salsal did that for them. Uh, uh, Ruwad did that for them. We brought the community and we brought in the kids that were not, were very shy. Their family did not want them to be in, in, uh, in, oops, we missed it. But that's okay. Uh, okay. Oops. Can you get it to play from your side, please? بديت أطبق على بناتي وأولادي كانوا يخبي علي شغلات كتير بناتي أود أنا استبدل إني أحورهم حتتهم أسيسهم لما أعصب أطلع من البيت فورا لما دخلت على الحملة ماما بطلت تضرب مرة كانت راحت على الاجتماع قاعدت أقول لأختي الصغيرة يلا ننظف أحسن ما أمي تتعب قاعدنا ننظف الدار لما خلصنا إجات خلتنا نلعب ودتنا مشاوير ماما دخلت حملة بيوت آمنة يعني تغيرت كثير صارت تقعد معنا وبطلت تستعمل إيديها والبربيج هي وبابا ماما مو بس بطلت الضرب صارت تدافع عن حقوقنا بعدين أبوي إيش قرر إنه يبطني بين المدرسة بعدين إيش ماما وقفت قدامه صارت تحكي له هاي بنتك ولازم تكمل تعليمها إلها مستقبل فجأة أبوي يوافق إنه يرجعني إيش على المدرسة ورجعت وإيش وحدة صف تاسع إيه بعد ما أمي انضمت لحملة بيوت عمل في رواد تمية تغيرت يعني تغير مفاجئ كثير تحولنا يعني تقول تاع يا مثلا يا محمد تاع قول إيش صار معك اليوم في المدرسة وش سويت إيش منيح وش منيح إيه مثلا أجيب معلومات مش منيحة تقول لي خلاص الامتحان الجاي بتحسن ترفع علي تحبني يعني هذا الشغلات قبل ما تنضم كانت ايش يعني تحكي لنا عن The, the Safe Homes campaign was another initiative in the community because we recognized that there is a problem of physical violence at home and at schools and we mobilized the whole community, the whole community, hundreds of them, mothers, fathers, school teachers, school uh, masters to come and, and in a very, very powerful manner they stood up and each basically talked about their own experience about either being abused or being abusers and, and, and among, within the whole community. And this is the result of what you saw here. Why did we do that? Because that's a community issue. They told us we have that issue and this is, and then Ruwad was their platform to actually address it. And then there's another campaign that was called the six minute campaign to, inc to increase readership among kids. 
Again, a short video here. للقاء. قررنا نطلق حملة عشان نشجع الناس على متعة القراءة. هاي الحملة سميناها بخمس دقائق ودقيقة. ست دقائق. ست دقائق. ست دقائق باليوم. إحنا كلنا مجموعة شباب نتواصل في جبل النظيف. هلا هدف حملتنا نوصل 5000 قارئ ان كان شاب ولا طفل ولا ام ولا اب ولا معلم and we وصلنا we got to 5000 5000 uh, mothers that read to their kids every night before they go to sleep other than their their uh, their uh, curriculum they started reading books and you know what happened is the mothers became readers it was not about the kids anymore It was about the mothers, mothers become, becoming re readers. And thank you. And then legal aid. People came to us in droves saying, saying to us, five minutes, saying to us, we don't know our rights. A policeman comes and knocks on the door and he comes in and we don't know whether he has the right or he doesn't have the right. We get our own family issues. We don't know how to handle it. A brother has a fight with a brother. A sister has a fight with a brother. Uh, they have inheritance issues. They have legal issues to the ownership of the house. They have zero legal representation. We opened a small, uh, with a legal firm in Jordan, that two lawyers volunteer eight hours every day in the community and they receive hundreds, hundreds of cases every month and they actually started trying cases in courts. So these people who did not have a legal, legal support suddenly had it. It was very easy. You needed to tap to, with, to someone else in society and say, are you willing to be part of that process? And you will be surprised how many people actually will stand up and say yes. And lawyers love it. If you talk to these two lawyers and they, they, uh, they rotate, you find that some people actually fight to get to that job because it gives them so much satisfaction. And then we created a small micro fund to create micro businesses in the community, not only there, but across the country. And in the past two years, we created 140 micro businesses, 450 jobs impacting 1,700 people through training. Again, everything is about micro. Everything about, is about empowerment of that individual. And uh, I have this passionate story to tell you about this young man, Ala al Salal, who created a company called Jamalon, which is the largest online Arabic bookstore. He is an incredible entrepreneur. He graduated from our, uh, from our program of, of scholarships. He went and studied in Jordanian universities, eventually got a scholarship in the West, and built the biggest online, online Arabic bookstore today. Jamalon, 10 million books. He is going to change the way Arabs are viewed in terms of reading. He says, Arabs, that concept that Arabs don't read is a misconception. It is because the books are not there and it's because it is expensive and the logistical process does not work. So if we create digital books, you will suddenly change the way of availability of books for Arabs. And Ala Salal came to me at his first day. He says, I want $1,000 to register a company. And then he said, I want $10,000 to build a website. And then eventually he raised $5 million in the past two years to create that incredible business. He is a son of Jabal al nadif He employs people from Jabal al nadif The graduates of our scholarship programs are employed by graduates themselves from their own programs. That is extremely powerful in how you address community development. And finally, every single company here, and there is much more, come and participate in a different manner. They give their knowledge, they give their capabilities, and they give their, their own uh, people and employees to come and participate in the community. And that's how you actually finally demarginalize both sides of the community. The haves and the have-mots meet in the middle, meet in the middle, talk, discuss, have a dialogue, and address their common issues. Their common issues of the well-being of society, of society in general. And here's my final video for you. We are in Jordan.
We are in Lebanon now. And we are in Egypt. And we are in Palestine, finally. This is the most important statistic you will have. 84,000 hours a year of volunteer work by the kids in their own communities. That is a massive resource, time and knowledge. So that's my story, that's my, my passion. If you ask me what is the most important thing for me in the past 10 years, I'll tell you it is what happened in Rouad. Thank you very much for listening. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بداية ودي أتقدم بالشكر للجميع على توجدهم اليوم. I also would like to say that it's a very special moment because I actually started my career in this city, so that's really where I started. Abu Dhabi was the beginning of of everything. I was trained here. I was prepared for for the world. Uh, when I was in Abu Dhabi, um, I had an issue of uh, going home at 2 in the afternoon. So I used to call on Abdul Aziz al Ghurair, who was just starting at Mashriq Bank, and I said, you know, what can I do in the afternoon? Can I find a job to work in the afternoon? That was actually the beginning of, of everything. So instead, what I did, I was really quite a good uh, uh, water skier. So I was one of the... Uh, um, the guys who did quite well in the afternoon from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock uh, in al Batin area. So that was really quite exciting. There was really a great beginning. A lot of people who helped me. They trained me, they put me on the right track. They encouraged me. They showed me how to decide and how to move on in life. But you know, I really agree with Fadi. I think, I think Fadi is such an incredible human being. He has done so much. Is it really all about business? Or is it about something else? I think it's about something else. So after spending five years in Abu Dhabi, I got married, I had my first child, restless in the city, wanting to do more, active. So I decided to take a jump and try Singapore. New city, new environment, but that's fine. I can handle that. And the reason is the slide before that. Can we go back to the next slide? The slide before this. See, this is really where everything starts. This is the story of, 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 a, of a man in the 1950s. He learned how to take decisions. He learned how to be brave. He learned how to continuously try. So imagine the 1950s. You have a Dow. You need to sail. There's no GPS system. There's no weather forecast. There are pirates in the sea. Not so friendly ports on the other side in the 1950s. These big ships, they leak. And if it leaks, it's really big, big trouble. So for you to decide in the 1950s to sail for days with that environment. First of all, you have to be brave. You have to have no fear. You have to be able to decide. But after you decide, you really have to act. And then you have to do that all the time. It's not one trip, it's not the second trip, it's third trip. You're almost you're going to the unknown. Because you're really going to the unknown. I was really influenced by my father because my father is a ship captain. So a lot of people ask me, they say, who really influenced you? And I say, my father influenced me because he took risk. He went to the unknown. He had two risks in his life, so twice. Now that really takes me back to Singapore and take me to how I behave in my life based on that experience. So Singapore, the economy was down, 
a new environment, new business, by the way. I came from the central bank in Abu Dhabi to, to uh, go and do a completely new business in the investment world. New government structure, new friends, new family. And the economy was down. But I was eager to change, I was eager to learn, be in a new environment. I never knew that Singapore will be as famous, as successful as it is today. Five years, six years after that, I had four kids. English and faith was an issue. I decided to go home. What have I got? I learned from the Singaporean speed, being positive, optimistic, try, don't hesitate. And you know something? I really believe every single one of you is exactly the same. Every one of you have something they love. Every one of you wants to do something. They must take the decision. They must act. No one will stop you. That's the only difference. So, what about, whatever I'm saying, it's really related to you as well. So that was a tough environment. The economy in Singapore improved. I head back to, uh, to my hometown. Again, came back to the city, and, and here where, where, where it differs. When I came back to Dubai, actually, it was not so much about the business because I, I, I spent time in the government. And that was time for change. And I want you to remember these words. If you do not change in everything you do, from the way you exercise, the way you play music, the way you do work every morning, the way you have a relationship with your family, I'm talking change to improve, you will fail. So that was time of change. I, spend, I created a new government department, hired new people, and the name of the game was Dismantle the System. Dismantle the government system. And we did that. Group of people that worked day and night, and we were passionate, and we were in love. We were in love, and we had pride for our country and our city. And we wanted to make a change. We've taken that decision, but what happened? We acted automatically. So the issue for every one of us is that if we see what we want and what we're really passionate about, whatever that, you want to play music, you want to play sport, you want to lose weight, you decide, but that's not enough. You need to act. And if you act, you have to act continuously. So continuous action is a must for you to succeed. In anything, absolutely anything. I'm giving you a government example, but I assure you, for anything else that you can think of. If you want to start a new business, if you want to debate with your boss, that's fine. Because with your boss, you really have to have a little bit of manner, so at least you know, the, the, the conversation doesn't go too far, one way or another. So those were really fabulous days. At that time, I was uh, I, I, with my colleagues. We started the Dubai Shopping Festival. We started the Dubai Quality Award. Um, I guess we started working afternoons instead of morning only. We started doing delivery service. I mean, somebody like Fadi was wonderful for us. So Aramex was doing delivery service of the government in the 1996 and so, and so on. So there was a lot of change, a lot of movement at that time. Again, love, passion, decide, action it, and continuously action. Now, a lot of people will doubt you. That shouldn't happen. You shouldn't listen. Because if they doubt you, you will never grow. You will never change. And remember, change and growing, they're together. And I'll give you other examples. I must say, at that time, uh, Sheikh Mohammed really uh, came to my life. He gave me the support. And by the way, we work hard, but every once in a while, we need a little bit of support. We need somebody to lift us up. But then me, I have to be man enough to stand up also. I mean, people will support you, but really, it's, it's, all, it's all with you. So are you brave enough to stand up? 
Now, of course, why we're doing that? Because we all believe, and I'm sure every single one of you believe, that life is a gift. Life is a gift. Look what, what you're doing, Fadi. It's a great gift what Fadi is doing. Every single one of you, no matter what you do, you are taking advantage of this valuable life. So, life is a gift, we must produce. And I tell you, I'll give you other reason why we must produce, and we must produce fast. Now, that was about five, six years. Uh, I was also quite involved in uh, Dubai. I was involved in the Dubai World Trade Center. So I was really w working around the clock. So Abdelaziz al ghrir used to call me and say, Muhammad used to call me from Abu Dhabi looking for work in the afternoon. Now you got it. Now you work day and night. So I hope you're enjoying it. But I was not working. It was fulfillment. I was fulfilling a feeling and a vision and a love and passion that I have to do. There was no money in it. I mean, the salary was what, 22,000 dirham, 23? But the love was way beyond the pride that you can do. The pride that you're a human being that produce. And that's why every one of you is here today. Because you want to listen to my story. Because you're eager to produce. You're eager to know what are the two, three things I've done right? What are the two, three things that I've done wrong? And how can you learn from them? Which is a great beginning. So remember, it's only human nature that every one of you would like to produce and move forward and grow. It's only natural. But do it. Act it. It might not work the first time. Do it again. It will work. Anyway, after that, I, uh, I decided that I think I should leave the government and maybe go again, start a new business. That was really the real estate business. I had a passion that, you know, our city will grow, we're a young city, and so that how it started. My first, uh, Kelly, my first project as a beginner in the business at Dubai Marina was like a, a 15 billion project. Have I done it before? No. Do I have experience? No. I have a lot of love. I have a lot of passion to learn. Every single one of you can learn, can do what I've done. I've never built one building before this. Not one. But are you going to go good, good people with you? And one thing you should not forget, you decide. So you have passion. You decide. You act. You work very, very hard. You have to work hard. This doesn't happen overnight. This doesn't happen, but it's so easy, so easy. Anyway, that's from there, we moved on, the company grew, a lot of people, um, where do we go next? We've done other stuff, but then we decided to build downtown. Now, the interesting story is that after we opened the Burj, and we, I'm so grateful to Sheikh Mohammed to give me the chance to do what I do, I'm so lucky. After we opened the Burj, I said, Your Highness, you know, there was a, there was a mistake in the uh, decision-making. I said, you have never asked me if I've built a building like this before in my life. And I said, you've never asked me if I hired somebody who built a building like that in their life. He smiled. He said, I trust you. Again, it's not about business. It's not about money. It's about human beings are born and you know why we should really do this more often? Because we are 44 years old. We are a baby country. Don't you think? We're a baby. We're a baby country. We need to work hard. We need to have love, have passion, act, grow, change continuously. And the reason, even though it's towards the end of my speech, I'll say it, the reason is that we got it easy. Why not? They took me to school. They dressed me. They took me to university. They guaranteed me a job. They gave me money to get married. They gave me a home. 
secure job. Absolutely 100% safe me and my children. What have I given? What have I given? I want every single one of you to ask yourself this question. And that's why we have, we have to have more love. We have to have more passion. We have to have more action. And more success stories. But you know what else we were given? Every single one of you agree. Everywhere we go, anywhere. And you say, I am from UAE. Or a residence of my colleagues from overseas. They say, I live in UAE. Everybody smiles. If I'm in Mozambique, or if I'm in... <laughs> or if I'm in Bombay, or if I'm in Beijing. Because we are so lucky that even when we produce the talk document to say where we are from, people smile and they respect us. Do you know how many people work so hard that when we say that we are from UAE, people basically open the doors for us. God bless his soul. Our father, Sheikh Zayed, have put so much time and effort and love and passion and true feeling to create that feeling. I have, a, I give you, I have to tell you the story. I have a, a great friend of mine, Chinese guy. He almost rules Africa. He travels to Africa, comes back. He always likes to come and, and love to eat uh, in the house. Big, big businessman. He said, you know, I went to uh, Eritrea, and something really strange happened in Eritrea. He said, you know, I'm a big businessman. I fly with my private planes. I land in Eritrea. I meet the president. The president is talking to me. And then, you know, I'm talking to him about gold mining. I'm talking to him. He keeps talking to me about Sheikh Khalifa and Sheikh Zayed. He said, I'm Chinese. Why are you talking to me about Sheikh Khalifa and Sheikh Zayed? I saw the president of Eritrea and I told him the story. He said, he said, yes, the Chinese got so frustrated with me. He want to talk to me about China and investment. And I'm talking about Emirates, Sheikh Khalifa and Sheikh, Sheikh Zayed, which was really incredible. So even though there are principles of doing business, growing, expanding, I think we have a huge duty, a huge duty to do more. So we do more of this. So somebody asked me, he said, you know, why, why are you doing this new tower? Kelly, can we go to the new tower? He said, why? why? I said, I need to do more for my country. I did the first one. Me and my colleagues in the office, we've learned a few things. We can do things better. But it's not about the tall building. It's not about Burj Khalifa. It's about that child and that family that in front of the Burj Khalifa or the new tower look and they smile. You know what the smile means? It means I belong to a civilized world. Very important for us. It means I'm proud. It means I'm proud of my country, I'm proud of my people, and we can do things. We have to do that. Let's jump to uh, maybe an interesting part, which is failure. I hope time is not too bad. Yeah, okay. Failures. Well, you know, without failures, I mean, we are going to be useless. Failure makes us resilient. We celebrate failure. We get up and run. We move on. We learn. We become stronger. We upgrade our skills because of failures. We must celebrate them. So yes, I had failures. I invested in the U.S. and I lost some money. I picked wrong partners, actually. <laughs> picking partners is a disaster. I, I didn't do very well in <laughs> picking partners because partners, they want to make money today. With our company, want to make money tomorrow. I uh, made mistakes in, um, in not bringing in more good people on my team. That's a major mistake I have. I should have brought in more better people earlier. But I'm fixing that mistake. But you know, there's, there's a line here, I say that, you know, 
You know the hungry people? Hungry people to do things. They destroy failure totally. What failure? Fall on your face, get up again. So with all my failures, of course, I must say that God is so kind. I've done so much in my life, and I'm so privileged and I'm so lucky, but the greatest achievement in my life are my children. I'm so proud of my children. They've, they make me so proud. That is really the greatest achievement, I must say. But of course, I spoke about, you know, about that we have so much and we have not given anything. We don't, we're not in, paying income tax. We, are pay, we don't pay tax. We don't pay anything. You know, I, I wish I could serve in the military. My age doesn't help. Now, the recent news last week from the military that I, again, my age doesn't fit the new t category too. Otherwise, I swear I'll be the first one. The first one. I don't care. <laughs> the feeling about your family, your people, your country, is the way you feel exactly about building another tall tower. Same. Love, passion. You decide. You take action. You fail, you get up. Every one of you have passion. Every one of you have love. Every one of you want to do something in music, want to do something in sport, want to do something in technology, want to do something in science, whatever it is. Please take a decision. Do it. Doing it is not easy. But do it. It will be fine. It will be easy. Trust me. It will be easier than you think. That is the only difference. So I say, please, before I end, I want you to be brave. I want you to take action. Go do what you, fall, what you love. Don't hesitate. Don't listen to these people who, dis, you know, who don't encourage you. And trust me, you'll, you'll do fine. I would like to uh, end and say that uh, I started about the story of the Tao, and uh, I would like to tell you that you know, my father really influenced my life, uh, and unfortunately he's uh, critically in hospital uh, this time. I just came back from seeing him, so I ask you to please pray for him. He's my hero. Thank you so much. Mohammed, the, the topic this evening is linear random or somewhere in between when it comes to success. And listening to your story, there's an element of randomness, and I'm wondering how do you balance in your life, and also when you're mentoring your children or colleagues, how do you strike that balance between having a plan and setting goals, between being opportunistic and, and going with the wind? Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, one of the words that I really uh, I live by and I forgot to mention is discipline. You have to, have, you have to be disciplined. You have to focus. Focus, discipline, and teaching yourself all the time. And, and you know, what I love about this gathering, that myself and Fadi, we're going into a new world where we are learning new things together. For me, thanks to my kids, they teach me all that. But I'm saying discipline is critical for you to, to do that. I think you have to learn and relearn everything. And then you have to work hard. And it if I look at, at your career, the third phase of your career is, is the most fascinating one, particularly the work with Luad. How did you take the lessons that you learned in business and apply them to that? You touched on this earlier on, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So uh, everything about what we do uh, in Ruad and, and anywhere else is about entrepreneurship and, and the entrepreneurial mind. So the entrepreneurial mind, just as you heard uh, Muhammad uh, tell, and his talk is about can do, is about passion, is about solutions, is about failure and success and standing up and saying this didn't work, we want to change it. And it's about positioning yourself in a marketplace of ideas. So when we went to uh, the community in Ruwad and they were very weary of us. I mean, we're strangers, we, we, they don't know who we are, we're the affluent, we're distant. And they had their own uh, ideological um, 
if you want, the people that were recruiting them on the ground in some cases. And so we said, why is this territory only left for people who are asking them for political stands? Where is this private sector? Why are we worried about our countries and the radicalization of our youth when we're not doing anything about it? So what does an entrepreneur do? He positions and says, if there is a product, let's call it, in the marketplace that says this, then how do I counter it? How do I come up uh, with a better product so that the community or the consumer, for that matter, uh, can actually adopt it and say, well, this is as good as anything else and I'm going to stick to this story. So uh, you bring uh, effectively a can-do mentality. A can-do mentality means I am not afraid, I'm going to take risk and I'm going to address this issue and I'm going to be driven to effectively make it happen. And the same question that I asked to Mohammed about linear versus random success, it strikes me listening to your, your plan when you began Rewad, that was quite linear. You had a plan, you figured out what the problems were, and then you came up with individual solutions, so, and then you made them happen. We thought it was going to be linear, but it came, it came to us as completely non-linear. It was totally it's accelerated the, and different. It's the Middle East. <laughs> exactly. So we went there. Uh, Richard, we went with a simple idea. I mean, I didn't think that we were going to do all this stuff. We went to a community who was on the margins, not to call them poor. They were rich in many things, but poor in material stuff. So when we went, I talked to them, I was saying, I, I want to come and do something with their, your youth. How can we empower them? Let's do scholarships. And then the community suddenly said, Okay, wait, 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 wait. There are so many problems you want to talk about here. And then suddenly they all throw it at, my, at us and say, okay, if you want our kids and you want to work with them, then the school needs to be fixed. I want a police station. I want a clinic. And if I had said, I, if I hesitated for a second and said, you know, this is not my job, I would have been done. But my entrepreneurial mind tells me I'm going to take risks and do stuff sometimes I don't know, just like Mohammed built the, the Dubai Marina. I said, okay, you want all these things? I am going to do them. And that's what created the trust that effectively where the community at the end of the day from total distrust to complete adoption. If you come and visit us one day in that community, we are so much part and parcel of their life. They completely uh, uh, put us within, with, we became a neighbor. We became a neighbor, and when you're a neighbor, they care about you just as you care about them. And, and if I look back to your, your early life, the picture of the 1950s Dow is, is fascinating. But I'm wondering for, for kids like, like mine growing up today in, in a very comfortable life, can they ever have that hunger that you had growing up in, in a very different world? If you've had all these creature comforts, well, it's a different type of hunger, I think, with, with great education and, and looking after them well at home. I think education is, 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 is the main base, but at the same time, what will you do with them after they finish their education? What opportunities are you going to share with them? How are you going to treat them when they present their ideas? How would you support them as they move about being a teacher or being a, you know, an e-commerce uh, person or wanting to be a businessman. So, so it all depends really how would you handle that situation. In my, with, with my kids, the four of them is that I said, you know, what do you really would like to do? We got you the good education and, and now we are starting and no pressure, but a little bit of pressure. There is no pressure, but a little bit of pressure. <clears throat> and then, okay, I mean, I have... You know, one of my daughters tried, to, tried one thing, did, were, not, were not very comfortable with it. I encouraged, I support a little bit. She moved to the second thing, the third thing. And then, so it all depends really what happens. Good education is a base, bringing up is a base. But then what do you do from there? How would you really support them to move on? But you know what? what what conversation are we having at home? What is that conversation? Many great leaders, they say, listen, what was going at home really influenced the way you know, I built my career and my future. I hope my children one day they say that. And, and uh, the reverse question, if, if you like, to you, in East Amman, where a lot of children have material, as you mentioned, very little, the school you showed us, very, very run down, how difficult is it to create a culture of success 
and ambition and, as you said, that can-do mentality when people have had a, a very, very tough upbringing. You need to give them hope at the end of the day and in the dialogue where we connected somewhere in the middle, where we felt that we are reaching out to them to understand our community better because com our community, they are part of the community. They're, they are our, uh, our country, our city. And they came to see us from distrust, from saying, who are these affluent people who really don't care about us? And they're doing well, they're living well, they have their own way of life. They don't, we barely visit each other. You know, a taxi driver, if you come to Amman and tell him, I want to go to Jabal al-Nadif, some taxi drivers will tell you, we're not going to go there. Because they think it's, you know, it's not secure for them. But, but it's so stupid. Because it's totally secure. But it's our ignorance that tells us this is a community because we didn't see it. So what, uh, what happens with these young kids, the, the young scholars, we've given out 1,500 scholarships in the past 10 years. And these kids that graduate tell you about how their life actually changed, how they feel that now they're a different character from saying, why did you forget us, to saying, even if you forget us, we are going to do something about our life, because this is our community. And we're not going to be forgotten anymore, because the graduates will remember us. And, you know, last year, the graduates of Ruwad came together, put some money, and are actually giving scholarships to the new students. And that's... Nice. That is the ultimate success. Even if one scholarship, it basically says the community understood what it is all about. We've got a number of questions to get to. We've got about 10 minutes or so. So, gents, rapid-fire questions and fairly rapid answers, if possible. First of all, to you, Mohammed. How, this is from Ali. He writes, how do you stay hungry when you've achieved so much already? Well, as I said, you know, I'm... I have to pay back. I haven't paid back. I don't pay taxes. I, don't, I mean, <laughs> the country is young. I need to do so much more, so much. So I guess I also have friends around me that think alike. I don't have friends who keep speaking negatively, thinking that it cannot be done, that we've done so much. Oh, my God, you know, nobody's giving us, nobody's doing. It's time for us to do. So I would say that it's... I don't think anybody feels, everybody almost feels it's human nature that they want to do, that they want to grow, that they want to act, just like me. I think I made the mistake by making few decisions, acted on them, and I realized everything works. So now I'm continuously uh, doing that. And if anybody has any doubts, please just you know, talk to me. I'll, 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 I'll tell you how I feel and how, and how it happens. To Fadi, what has Ruad taught you about success that Aramix did not? And a follow-up question, could Ruad have been achieved if Aramix did not come first? A good question. I, uh, well, well, you know, Ruad, I'll have to tell you, was originally a, a CSR program within Aramix. So that was an Aramix initiative. And it was me within that initiative also at Aramex. So could it have been achieved? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I don't know. I can't answer that question. But I can tell you uh, that my being so lucky and so blessed that Aramex allowed me to actually do this is, is what, 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 uh, what my answer would be. It, Aramex enabled me. My, my material capabilities and my being blessed at Aramex allowed me to say, I have enough, and then I need to collect a lot of my friends who have enough and say, here's a place where we can do what, what Muhammad has been talking about is, you know, he says, I don't pay taxes, but I can do so much more. And that's the, it's a statement. If, what do you want to do within your own country? Are you only an entrepreneur and a business person, or are you going to be part and parcel of the development of the community that is not as lucky as you are? So it, I, it taught me everything. It taught me how to appreciate society as a whole and not only my own neighborhood. Question for you, Mohammed. It's a question about expatriates in the UAE. I'll paraphrase it. How do you balance wanting to promote the interest of Emiratis through programs like emiratization with encouraging expatriates to be successful, giving them opportunities to thrive in the public and private sector? I'll go back to your first question of, of you know, what makes get you hungry. I think one of the things that we should look at, just look at the news and look, at, look around you. 
So I think there are many good reasons that we should hung, be hungry and do more when you look at what's going on in, in the world. Uh, going back uh, to that, I think you know the UAE is uh, such a great example on when it comes to diversity, when it comes to uh, you know respect for cultures, respect for for faith. Uh, so I think I, I really I've never I mean that's how we grew up in in the UAE. We really never looked at the person and we decided is this. Uh, an expat thing, or is this a local thing? At least this is the way I think. So I think really all fields are quite open and respectful that look at, I mean, there's a good example that, you know, we've never looked at, at Fadi as an expat. Fadi is Fadi, and, you know, he's created an incredible I'm, organization. I'm, I'm, I'm from here. Uh, there we go. Yes, and I'm proud. I'm proud. <laughs> but I'm saying, if you will, if you'll accept. we love you dearly. <laughs> we love you for that. But I'm saying, again, you've got a lot of other businesses in the country that are owned by expats. Now, if you have the energy, if you can do, I think the, field, the fields are open. Fadi, you have residency in Emirates airplanes, don't you? I think you spend more you time know, in the air You know, my first residence permit in, in, in the UAE was in 1983. So I'm an, I'm an old timer. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in town for a long, long time. I didn't live here continuously, but I had a continuous residence permit since 1983. And I've seen the city explode in terms of this country explode in terms of development, and I tallied along. You know, it was flying, and I was at the tail. Wherever it went, I went with it. And, he, and, he and brought, I'm proud. And he, and he I'm brought, proud. And he brought with him a lot of uh, bright people, too. Yeah, yeah. And I, I you know, I, I caught on. Uh, every opportunity that this, this country opened up, we were, uh, we were present, and we all benefited from it. And we are blessed that, uh, that this God. place is, is, the, is the final safe haven for all of us Arabs. We come here to, to exercise our talent, and this country allows us to do that. And that's, that's, that's no little thing, by the way. That's no little thing. And every research that uh, Sunil does at, uh, at ASDA for the Arab Youth Survey, you Arab, have to youth, Sunil's name Arab, also here. Arab youth will always tell you, we all want to come to the <laughs> UAE. So you'd better wait, <laughs> accept a lot of new kids coming to town. Here's a really interesting, obvious, but interesting question. How did you balance work and family life, particularly in the early days? Well, I think I could have done better. Could have done better. But um, at the end of the day, you know, you speak to Mariam and you speak to my kids, and thank God, you know, it went well, alhamdulillah, and many other people as well. Uh, they were able, I mean, you've got people who are really not busy sometimes, they don't do the balance. So I was okay, I could have done better, but thank God, you know, everything is. is you know, everything is going well. My, my kids and Mariam are, are all well, and, and, uh, and you know, which means that it did work, thank God. But as I said, you have to be disciplined. You really have to be. You know, I spent 12 years, I only fly night flights. 12 years, I fly only six, uh, 12, 2 a.m., so I can land at 6, 6 a.m. in Europe and come back same day. But you know, I was young, I can handle it. I mean, like many of you, so you should do it. There's, there's, there's no harm in doing that. So, that helped me balance, you know. I stay with the kids, everybody goes to bed, and then I'm out to the airport. Another question we've got in, have we got time? The question was to both of you, what three things would you tell your 21-year-old self? What advice would you give you? We haven't got time for, for three things each, but one thing each. Fadi, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self? Never take anything for granted. Why do you pick that? Because life is full of surprises, and you're going to enjoy them so much if you don't take them for granted. So take advantage of everything that comes to you. And, and, uh, you know, and life can change within a split of a second. So uh, don't feel too comfortable in your chair. Mohammed, I think first you have to be grateful. If you are sitting in this place, I think number one, you have to be grateful. Number two, I think you have to work really, really hard. And uh, number three, I really think that you should look after your society, your family, your country. That must be, there must be something in there to hold you, and that's the base of it. A couple more questions. This is interesting. It's a very vulnerable question, and they're always the, the best ones. Someone writes, I know my capabilities and that I can make successful achievements, but I often find myself hesitant. How do I gain a risk-taking or courageous attitude in order to, in your words, Decide and act. Come with me. <laughs> I mean it. Let's go give it a try. 
And uh, it's a related question that was specifically can to I you. Say, can I say a, yeah. a small story which is yeah. relevant to Abu Dhabi? Uh, my son, who is 29 years old and uh, is a filmmaker, he created a film called Deep. Has, have any of you seen Deep? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in Abu Dhabi, they love Deep. So Deep is going yeah. to the Oscars. And, and my son came five years ago to me. He says, I have the script. He's a script. He was the script writer and the producer. He says, I have the script. And um, I don't know what to do with it. It's so difficult to build a film. And, uh, and so what, what do I do? I said, go for it. Life is about taking risks. So I don't know what's going to happen with that film. <laughs> it's your thing. I can't help you. Don't, I, I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to help you. Go collect your friends and, and uh, raise your money and do your thing. And on the 28th of February, his film is, is going to be at the Oscars. So it's fantastic. <laughs> and why do I mention Abu Dhabi? Because as he was raising money, Abu Dhabi Media and our good friend Noor Al Kaabi actually was one of the people that supported him. So, uh, so Abu Dhabi has part of that story to be owned. So if it makes it, it's yours also. We've got about a minute and a half left. To Fadi, what is your relationship with fear? It looks like you were never scared throughout the entire process of your achievements. Did you have a secret formula? There's no secret formula. Actually, I am so scared of everything that I do. If I wasn't scared, I wouldn't be here. You need to be scared. You need to understand fear, to understand risk, and to understand what you can and what you cannot do. So I didn't do anything that was crazy. Uh, and, and I know I do have fear. I have fear of God. I have fear of, my, of, of losing whatever I have. And that paranoia actually keeps me up every single day to make sure that uh, I am there, I am doing the right thing, and I'm not going to lose it. So, with, with look, uh, back to, to the question you asked, uh, you asked Muhammad about, uh, uh, about success and about stuff. It's, it's, you, it is so difficult to balance between, in, in life, between, between your work and your, uh, and, and your other things that you are passionate about. So, you end up compromising along the way. And, and, and fear, is at the core of you compromising on things you might not want to be compromising on. So your business ends up consuming you much more, on, uh, much more than, than your family should have consumed you, unfortunately. Final question, then we'll wrap up. I'll put it to both of you. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about everyone needs support sometime, and you had it from, among others, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. Christine Lagarde today at the Women's Forum said, everyone needs, her phrase was, a champion sometimes. So my question to both of you, first of all to you, Mohammed, what do people have to do, young or old, to convince people like you or, or others to be their mentor? What qualities do you have to see in someone for them to get a mentor like you, if not you, then someone in your position? Well, for me, I, I, would, I really would love to see people that are hungry, people who don't give up. I mean, I have people who chase me. You know, I'm leaving a hotel and this guy's chasing me. He said, I'm on the police, but you know, I, don't, I think I can do more. I said, wow. I said, you know, listen, I'm busy. I have an appointment. He said, but no, no, hold on. I just I want to talk to you. I just, I, listen. So I, I really like hungry people. I like people who can learn quickly. And I like people who work hard. Because when you, the harder you work, as they say, the luckier you get. Fadi, same question to you. So uh, it's very simple for me. I, I, in mentorship, you want people that listen and don't think that they know everything, and have empathy. So I'm, I'm a mentor, I mentor a lot of people. I mean, being, as a, being an investor in tech companies, I end up sitting with people that are my kids' age all the time. They think, they think I'm their mentor, but in reality, they're my mentor. I get, because I, I listen, agree. I learn. I, I learn about the technology space <laughs> yes, from yes. them, because I have no idea what they were talking about originally. Yes, yes, well done. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thanks very much indeed. Let's show our appreciation, Mohammed Alibar, His Excellency, and Fadi Gandor. Thank you very much indeed.